Tucked away in a dusty corner of most Christian believers' Bibles is the little-known book called the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. There are probably various reasons for its neglect, but perhaps the most significant factor is that it appears to celebrate what we might call the joys of sex. And almost universally Christians have been rather embarrassed when the S word has been mentioned. They have not of course been alone in this. However the idea that the spiritual life is somehow incompatible with delight in physical attraction and sexual fulfilment has characterised Christianity for much of its history. Some Bible honouring Christians have of course recognised that if the scriptures are God's words then something has to be made of the testimony of this little booklet. I have a volume in my library which lists over 100 attempts by Bible teachers to understand and apply it. Perhaps most popular is an approach first found in later Judaism where the book was seen to be one that described the relationship of God and his people. Christians following this lead have suggested that it is to be read as an allegory or picture of the relationship between Christ and the church or Christ and the individual believer. This has inspired a flowering of remarkable books on the nature of the spiritual life. One of the finest is still the commentary of Bernard of Clairvaux. Most recently Christians have been inspired to greater intimacy with Jesus through the writings of James Hudson Taylor, Watchman Nee and others who have followed Bernard's lead. And some Christian mystics, Teresa of Avila among them, still describe their own encounters with Jesus in erotic language which is drawn from the song and this particular way of interpreting it. Of course any depiction of love is at best likely to reflect the nature of God who is love and embraces us in his love. To this extent Bernard and both his predecessors and followers were instinctively right to apply the song in the way that they did. However, a knowledge of Near Eastern literature, especially that which was written in antiquity, would suggest that the starting point for reading this book is to read it as one which celebrates human sexuality. That it does so in a uniquely beautiful way is perhaps echoed in the title The Song of Songs. In the Hebrew language this phrase amounts to meaning that this is the best song that has ever been written. So this little book rehabilitates the enjoyment of physical sex at its best as part of the message of the Bible and therefore the message of the Christian Church. In a world where it sometimes appears that there is little else that is subject of discussion, it provides Christian believers with the opportunity or rather the mandate to openly address questions of sex. However, before we explore the song's teaching there are some preliminary issues we need to address. The question is frequently raised as to who wrote the book. Traditionally the first words, the Song of Songs, which is to Solomon, has been seen as a claim to Solomonic authorship. The word to Solomon could, however, refer to it being his favourite song or one included in the collection of books that received inspiration from him. It's not easy to resolve this question of authorship and the best translation may be quote, the finest song in the Solomonic collection, but more of this question of authorship later. What we can be sure of is that this was a work intended to be performed in song and was regarded from its earliest publication as a lasting chart topper, the best of all songs. Perhaps the reason for this is hinted at in the use of the name Solomon. The name of the king is a play on the word Shalom. Shalom is a very important word in the Bible and refers to the enjoyment of a life that is full to the brim with all that satisfies. It describes life as it's intended to be lived and experienced in God's world and so it will reveal to us the enjoyment of our sexuality as a fundamental part of what it means to be human and created after God's image. Another question that's often asked is what sort of song is it? 
Is it rather like an opera which contains a plot line? If it is, what is the story? And if it is a story, who are the players and how many are there? Once again, there's no consensus. It seems best then to me to view the book as a collection of different songs which at best are linked together in some sort of thematic way. Song cycles have a place in classical music today, and perhaps this is an early example. And if there is a structure to be recognised, it may be that the first half includes songs that reflect courtship, whereas the second half of the marriage depict the marriage relationship uh, through the experience of an ideal couple. This is the approach that I will use here. As we approach the song in this way, we will discover that while it describes the joys of human sexuality, it's not blind to some of the issues that sometimes cloud even the most beautiful and intimate of relationships. However, there are some issues that it does not address. It unquestionably describes heterosexual sex. It does not, however, reflect upon the same-sex attraction or offer answers to the questions that arise from this. However, it is consistent with the teaching of the Bible as a whole, and indeed the Church down the centuries, which says that the divine intention is that sexual fulfilment is only properly to be enjoyed between a man and a woman within the context of marriage. It also does not have anything to say to those who have been called, whether voluntarily or of necessity, to the celibate life. And further, since it mostly concentrates on sex at its best, it does not directly address those for whom what is depicted here is a far cry from their own experience. For some then, the re reading this book will be a difficult experience. In some cases this will be reflected in their perhaps wistful longing for something rather more than the barely satisfying experience that has characterised one's own relationship. At its worst, it will appear to merely mock those for whom sex has been one of brutal and de dehumanising abuse. We will try to be sensitive to these issues as we explain the message of the song and show that even for the abused this book has something beautiful to say. For the present, however, we conclude with a brief summary. As we begin to study this book we are to recognise it as one upon which God has stamped his authority by telling us that this is his number one song of all time. We also now understand that reflecting as it does the very nature of God and his relationship with it, it is nevertheless fundamentally about the experience of an enjoyment of physical sex. Since this is so, it will help us as Christians to escape from the embarrassment occasioned when others speak about it. In fact, we will be able to show that not only is the Bible positive about sex, but that it also offers guidance as to how it can best be enjoyed. It will also help us who too often feel somewhat guilty of our sexuality. If God is not ashamed of our sexuality, we certainly should not be. For after all, he made us the way that we are, and he did so in order that we might both reflect him and enjoy life in all its fullness.